Path of the Pole by Charles Hapgood, Part 3. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. Back on the Edwards Plateau, off of the Columbia Plateau. Right. Where we were, I spent two weeks and Kyle spent one week in the Washington Channel Scablands with Randall, uh, Brad, and Ben from Uncharted X. And Graham uh, from Grimerica. Graham from Grimerica. David Matheson was there. Brandon Powell was a great time. And then, of course, all the attendees. You guys were great. It was a fantastic time. Both groups were awesome. So, and I'll shout out to my, to my buddy Matt. He showed up with his whole family. That was cool. So, yeah. Uh, oh, and the Watcher has joined us at the beginning of a show, a rare event these days, from deep beneath his secret space station in secret outer space. Watcher, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great, guys. Glad to be here. Wow. Been a, been a hectic couple days, but it's, uh, it's, it's been good. You got the you got the ocarina of time summoning <laughs> there. It was it was fantastic. <laughs> Brings me into focus every time. Yeah. So you're you're in Florida, huh? You're you're hovering over Florida, watching watching over like disaster recovery. Is that what's going on? Yeah, yeah. In the Fort Myers area. Okay. Yep. Wow. You're a hero, buddy. I have to say, I think it's awesome. Really appreciate yeah, that stuff. Uh, appreciate yeah. the support, guys. Yeah, it's it's rewarding work, but it's uh, it's definitely difficult at times, especially being away from home. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. Well, we're glad to have you here, even out on the road, space road. However, you say that, <laughs> out on the space road, the lanes of space. <laughs> <laughs> Just driving along the belts. <laughs> All Van right, Allen Parkway. Yeah, that's right. So we're um, continuing on with The Path of the Pole by Charles Hapgood. Wait. Oh. It's too soon. Is it too soon? I'm just not in the mood yet. You're not ready yet. Uh, I just mm. kind of just just need one more like um, focus. There we go. Okay. All right. We can Are you do ready it now? now? <laughs> Aziz. Okay. So Charles Hapgood. Again, check the show notes for links to this book. You can, uh, I have it on Kindle, but you can buy it hard copy, you know. But I encourage everybody to get the book. Uh, as always, with the beginning chapters, I'm reading uh, most of it, not all of it. But as we get further and further into the book, I'll skip more and more as I'm really just digging into the extremely pertinent data. But always in the beginnings of these books, you have to kind of... got to set the table. Yeah, you got to set the table, read most of it. Uh, and also, this book has multiple forwards. So this is the final forward, which is the first one in the book called Forward to the Second Edition. So I'm going to read this real quick. So it says, like many people, I was introduced to Earth's shifting crust, not by reading the original text, nor through discussion in the technical journals, but through reading an abridged version in the Saturday Evening Post. This was an unusual experience to read something of scientific interest in a family magazine. But what I read was even more unusual. I found myself reading a reasonably plausible explanation, the first ever printed, of the major deformations that have racked the Earth's crust. The abbreviated version so intrigued me that I acquired a copy of the complete work at the earliest opportunity. The full text proved to be even more stimulating than its abbreviated predecessor. That first edition of the book was introduced to the public through its foreword by the eminent scientist Albert Einstein. I must confess that this fact impressed me to a considerable degree. At the time, it never occurred to me that I might be asked to present the second edition. In fact, this still strikes me as somewhat incongruous. Perhaps at this point, I should briefly introduce myself to the reader. I am a mining geologist and a passable mineral mineralogist engaged in recent years in teaching these subjects. Geology, like all branches of science, has become separated into a maze of specializations. 
The adherents of one specialization are certainly more than dimly aware of what is going on in other fields, but can hardly consider themselves expert in any but their chosen field. I should not care to be accused of implying, through failure to admit the contrary, that I am a competent critic of Hapgood and Campbell's work. I most emphatically am not. After carefully reading Earth's shifting crust, I began searching through the technical journals and other likely sources for the discerning criticism that I felt should be forthcoming from experts in the field. And I should have known better than to expect it, I suppose, but hope springs eternal. A reaction came, of course, and largely it came from men who, under ordinary circumstances, are both rational and competent. But their reaction could hardly be described as rational. Hysterical would be a better description. One observed indignantly that Hapgood was not a geologist. <laughs> Admittedly, this is a cardinal sin, but hardly one punishable by scientific, scientific excommunication. Another cited, but failed to name, a scientist whose findings conflict with those of several world-renowned authorities selected by Hapgood as sources of technical data, and used this lack of agreement as an incontrovertible condemnation of the entire book. I could continue with numerous examples, but this would be pointless. The fact is that almost without exception, Americans commenting on the book couched their discussion in thick and unwarranted sarcasm, selecting trivia and factors not subject to verification as the basis for condemnation, seeking in this way to avoid the basic issues. Only the European reviewers were gracious enough to be fair. Not that they accepted the theory without question, but they were prepared to offer it its day in court. Nowhere in all that has been written about the book have I found a single authority who has calmly and rationally offered a clear and documented criticism of the basic theory involved that uncompensated masses on or in the earth may cause the earth's crust to slip over its core. Frankly, I wish someone would. In the years since publication of the first edition of this work, we have had, among other things, the benefit of the research of the International Geophysical Year. Incorporation of these and other data has had two extremely important effects on Hapgood's theory. First, to force a revision of the theory in relation to the mechanism of crustal displacement. And secondly, to add tremendously to the weight of evidence supporting the thesis that crustal displacement has occurred. Regarding the first of these, I believe that the author is to be congratulated for having the flexibility to adapt to new facts as they become available. For the second, whereas there may have been a time where the occurrence of dislocations of the crust with respect to the Earth's rotational poles could have been questioned, I personally feel that in the light of the data presented by Hapgood in this, the second edition of his book, such dislocations are no longer a matter of question. Like many another engaged in teaching, I have grown weary of apologizing to my students for teaching time-worn theories whose logic, to use a kind word, is indefensible. The, fact, the plain fact is that the logic of all previous theories of the Earth's deformation is so obviously contrived, the holes are so gaping, that one is inclined to suspect that danger lurks there for the unwary. Now at last, in Hapgood and Campbell's theory, actually a coalition of several older and poorly enunciated ideas, we find the first outwardly reasonable explanation of the observed facts in several major geological fields. Now I ask, no, I implore my colleagues, those most competent to assume the task, to attack this theory with the weapons of well-documented proof, or, failing this, let them build upon it to a better, clearer understanding of the forces that have deformed this planet we live on. Let us not bury this idea prematurely through prejudice, as so many valuable ideas of the past have been buried, only to be sheepishly exhumed in later years. If it is an unworthy thing, let it be properly destroyed. If not, let it receive the nourishment that it deserves. F. N. Earl, Department of Geology, Montana College of Mineral Science and Technology. Man, when was that? That's great. He wrote this for the second edition, so was it the 1970s? Yeah. What a fantastic yeah. intro. Okay. So we Need more guys like that. Right. So we're moving to chapter three. The failure to explain climatic change. In the last chapter, it was suggested 
that the ice ages can be explained by the assumption of frequent displacements of the Earth's crust, but that they cannot, at least for the recent time, the Pleistocene epoch, be explained by continental drift. The ice ages, however, represent only one side of the problem. If they are instances of extremely cold climates distributed in an unexplained manner on the Earth's surface, there were also warm climates whose distribution is equally unexplained. In connection with these warm climates in the present polar regions, there arises a contradiction of an, of an especially glaring character. On the one hand, there is evidence that the distribution of plants and animals in the past did not, as a rule, follow the present arrangement of the climatic zones. On the other hand, the trend of the new evidence is to show that climatic zones have always been about as clearly distinguished by temperature differences as they are today. This is in flat contradiction to the assumption, which is still widely held, that the Earth, during most of geological history, did not possess cl clearly demarcated climatic zones. We are forced to conclude that, since many ancient plants and animals were not distributed according to the present climatic zones, the zones themselves have changed position on the Earth's surface. This requires, as we have seen, that the surface shall have changed position relative to the axis of rotation. We shall now examine the evidence that supports this view. So I think this is interesting, you know, kind of tying back into what we were talking about um, on part two. He's basically saying, so we have anomalous cold areas like we were talking about. There are massive ice sheets in southern India and in Africa. He's also saying that, like, there's also evidence of very warm areas in what are now extremely cold places. Right. Like Siberia. Right. Like and, and he's also kind of saying, we'll get, it gets more detail later, but he's also kind of saying that so, the idea that the whole earth was just totally frozen and that explains like anomalous cold areas. And then other times the whole earth was really nice and warm. He's like, no, all throughout the ages, you basically see that there were, there are climatic zones showing seasons and temperate, you know, temperatures, so, but they're just not aligned with the current poles. But is he also saying that we don't have good uh, climatic zones defined in far into the past? In some cases, that's true. Because, yeah. like, we, how do we define those, right? We have our current climatic zones. Yeah. And the you only define them by the nature of the animals. Yeah, the nature the of the animals in the sediment or the, core, you know, yeah. what, what the ice cores show and that's all that right. kind of yeah. stuff. So it looks like if you were going to turn it into climatic zones, that those zones moved all over the planet yeah but in we don't reference have a model to each other yeah so we don't have a model to just dis to to describe why that happened that right way. yeah he's saying that that's the evidence unlike um, what the common story is is that sometimes there's ice ball earth right, and other times right. there's like warm planet everywhere because they seem to move with in yeah. reference to each other yeah, yeah. and that the zones this themselves is so, this is just like like if you think about it it's just like the thought that all the stuff in the sky is going around the earth. Uh, it yeah, looks yeah. the same. Right. And then eventually they figure out, wait a minute, we're spinning. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it, looks, yes. it doesn't change the way it looks. Right. Yeah. Okay. So part one, ages of bloom in Antarctica. There have been many times during the history of the globe when the continent of Antarctica, now covered by a polar ice cap as much as two miles thick, and covering an area of nearly 6 million square miles, had warm climates. So far as we know at present, the very first evidence of an ice age in Antarctica comes from the Eocene epoch. Should we have our chart up here, maybe? This was... You need freaking charts. <laughs> Kyle, I this just want to I mean, sit is, back again, and I have listen to and not do any I have work. to interrupt you again. No, I'm, I'm doing a lot of thinking over here. <laughs> It's I hard. Pull up a chart. I want to sit back Stupid and just chart. listen. I don't even know if I have the chart. <laughs> I'm going to have to look it up. What, was, what were you interrupting me for? <clears throat> um, the, yeah, the, the Antarctica has a two-mile-thick ice sheet. Yeah. And then, like... And it's six million square miles yeah, of but, ice. but... We look back at the, you know, we we talk about the the ice sheets over North America and stuff, and how how thick were they? Yeah, a couple miles, two miles thick, yeah. roughly. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's like is this this is the polar ice, right? That's the point. Yeah. This is how thick 
the ice on the poles gets. Right. That's right. And we were talking about the the story about the moon, the one of the moons of Saturn. Mm. And they're like the saline content of the water will determine how thick the polar ice caps That's get. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Now that may be a different scenario cuz it's not doesn't have a big atmosphere, but Anyways, continue. Okay, so in the start. Eocene epoch, epoch, this was barely 60 million years ago. Before that, for some billion and a half years, there is no suggestion of polar conditions, though very many earlier ice ages existed in other parts of the Earth. Henry, in The White Continent, cites evidence of the <laughs> passing of long temperate ages in Antarctica. He describes the Edsel Ford Mountains discovered by Admiral Byrd in 1929. These mountains are of non-volcanic, folded sedimentary rocks, the layers adding up to 15,000 feet in thickness. Henry suggests that they indicate long periods of temperate climate in Antarctica because, I think he's about to say this, but you don't get that much sediment. I wasn't listening because I'm looking up a chart. Oh, I'm sorry. Folded mountains made up of folded sedimentary rocks, 15,000 feet of sedimentary rock. Where? In Antarctica. Dang. So, quote, this is from Henry in that book, in the book, uh, The White Continent. The greater part of the erosion probably took place when Antarctica was essentially free of ice, since the structure of the rocks indicates strongly that the original sediment from which they were formed was carried by water. Such an accumulation calls for an immensely long period of tepid peace in the life of the rampaging planet. Most sedimentary rocks are laid down in the sea, formed of sediment brought down by rivers from nearby lands. The lands from which the Antarctic sediments were, seemed to, were brought seem to have disappeared without a trace. But of the sea that once existed where there is now land, we have plenty of evidence. Brooks remarks, In the Cambrian, we have evidence of a moderately warm sea stretching nearly or right across Antarctica in the form of thick limestones very rich in reef-building uh, animals. Millions of years later, when these marine formations had appeared above the sea, warm climates brought forth a luxuriant vegetation in Antarctica. Thus, Sir Ernest Shackleton is said to have found coal beds within 200 miles of the South Pole. And later, during the Byrd Expedition of 1935, geologists made a rich discovery of fossils on the sides of lofty Mount Weaver in latitude 86 degrees, 58 degrees south or 86 degrees, 58 minutes south, about the same distance from the pole and two miles above sea level. These included leaf and stem impressions and fossilized wood. In 1952, Dr. Lyman H. Doherty of the Carnegie Institution of Washington completed a study of these fossils, identified two species of a tree fern called Glossopteris, once common to the other southern continents, Africa, South America, and Australia, and a giant tree fern of another species. In addition, he identified a fossil footprint as that of a mammal-like reptile. Henry suggests that this may mean that Antarctica, during its period of intensive vegetation, was one of the most advanced lands of the world as to its life forms. Very interesting. Soviet scientists have reported finding evidences of a tropical flora, in Gramland, another part of Antarctica, dating from the early tertiary period, or perhaps from the Paleocene or Eocene. It is then little wonder that Priestley, in his account of his expedition to Antarctica, should have concluded, There can be no doubt, from what this expedition and other expeditions have found, that several times, at least during past ages, the Antarctic has possessed a climate much more genial than that of England at the present day. Further evidence is provided by the discovery by British geologists of great fossil forests in Antarctica of the same type that grew on the Pacific coast of the United States 20 million years ago. So forests in Antarctica of the same kind of trees that were found on the Pacific coast of the U.S. that grew there 20 million years ago. That's crazy. This, of course, shows that after the earliest known Antarctic glaciation in the Eocene, the continent did not remain glacial, but had later episodes of warm climate. So you've got coal, you've got large mammal species, numerous different types of forests, ferns, and other fauna. 
at multiple different periods and in indicating that bef like before it ever became glaciated, it had multiple different uh, epochs of different climates, and then it becomes ice covered, and then later there's a warm period, and so on and so forth, back and forth with coal beds and everything. So, <clears throat> so that would be when it was not at the poles, or just closer, close to the pole, but not all the way. Like, yeah, that it, they it has spent time up in the almost tropical areas of the planet. Okay, so he's suggesting that when it was covered in ice, it actually had moved closer to the pole. Oh and yeah, it moved down. Yeah, and it moved, so there's it's a lot moving of around. Yeah, so Hapgood's idea, like I've been reading way forward in the book, and like he thinks this happens a lot. Yeah, so it's moving around a lot. Yeah. Okay. That gives me hope <laughs> that we can find those pyramids. <laughs> what? What hope for what? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's t yeah for sure. <laughs> That Texas will get closer to the North Pole and yes. we'll get colder down here? <laughs> okay. Hope for that, too. Umgrove adds the observation that in the Jurassic period, the floras of Antarctica, England, North America, and India had many plants in common. So, and the other thing you always have to remember with this is that with the polar regions, you're not just talking about temperature, but, you know, the amount of sunlight. You just can't have... Yeah, of course. You, you you can't have a bunch of green plants where it's dark for six months. Right. There is one group of theories for explaining these facts to which we cannot appeal because of their inherent and obvious weaknesses. These are the theories that try to explain warm and cold periods in Antarctica by changes in land elevations, changes in the directions of ocean currents, changes in the intensity of solar radiation, and the like. It is obvious, for instance, that no hypothetical warm currents could make possible the existence of warm climates in the center of the great Antarctic continent. If that continent were at the pole and if by some miracle Antarctica did become warm, how could forests possibly have flourished there deprived of sunlight for half the year? Yeah. So you might, you could get scrub, you know, like bushes and yeah. grasses and stuff that would, that can grow in, in a season. Yeah. Right. But they won't, you won't have, Trees, whole trees forests that take yeah that large mammals that need large forests that have small I, animals I to think, eat. I mean, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that you would get trees that. I mean, well, watcher, maybe you can look it up. But what kind of trees grow where, like in maybe Alaska or somewhere where it gets where it's dark, where it's dark for half yeah. the year? Okay, if there are any. Part two: Warm ages in the north. The Arctic regions have been more accessible, and consequently they have been more thoroughly explored than the Antarctic. It was from them that the first evidence came of warm climate floras in a polar region. Most of the theories developed by those defending the theory of the permanence of the poles were specially designed to explain these facts. I think this is interesting. The theories developed by those defending the theory of the permanence of the poles are specially designed to explain the problem of warm climate flora and fauna discovered in polar regions. One method of explaining the evidence was to, to suggest that the plants and animals of past geological areas, even though they belong to similar genera or families as living plants and living plants and animals, so modern ones, and closely resembled these in structure, may have been adapted to very different climates. So, okay. Past so, geological eras? It says areas, but you're probably right. It means eras. But yeah, so the idea here is that, okay, so that plant looks a lot like this modern plant we have. It's almost completely exactly the same, but that plant is actually totally different than this modern plant. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right. That's what they're saying. It looks the same, but really it's a polar plant, even though the one we have now is a tropical one. Got it. Which is not something they would ever do with anything else, right? <clears throat> This is like, we're, you know, we're making an exception to keep our theories the way we want them yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This argument often had effect for no one could exclude the possibility that in long geological periods, in a long geological period, species might make successful adjustments to different climatic conditions. Where single plants were involved, such a possibility could not be dismissed. Where, however, whole groups of species, whole floras and faunas were involved, there was increased improbability that they could all have been adjusted at any one time to a radically different environment from that which their descendants live today. 
For this reason, and because the structure of plants has a definite relationship to conditions of sunlight, heat, and moisture, biologists have abandoned this method of explaining the facts. Barghorn, for example, says that fossil plants are reliable indicators of past climate. It may be worthwhile to review very briefly some high points of the climatic history of the Arctic and subarctic regions, beginning with one of the oldest periods, the Devonian, and coming down by degrees to periods nearer our own. The Devonian evidence is particularly rich and includes both fauna and flora. Dr. Colbert of the American Museum of Natural History has pointed out that the first known amphibians have been found in this period in eastern Greenland, near the Arctic Circle, though they must have required a warm climate. Many species of reef corals, which at present require an all-year seawater temperature of not less than 68 degrees Fahrenheit, have been found in Ellesmere Island, far to the north of the Arctic Circle. Devonian tree ferns have been found from southern Russia to Bear Island in the Arctic Ocean. According to Barghorn, assemblages of Devonian plants have been found in the Falkland Islands, where a cold climate now prevails, in Spitsbergen and in Ellesmere Island, as well as in Asia and America. In view of this, he remarks, The known distribution of Devonian plants, especially their diversification in high latitudes, suggests that glacial conditions did not exist at the poles. In the this, is, this is, first of all, let me read what the watcher just put up. He says, spruce trees and evergreens form the tree line, but the polar Arctic tundra is defined by the absence of trees. The tree line defines the polar border and Arctic circle. So there are no trees mm. beyond that line. Uh, that's great. similar to mountaintops, right? Yeah. There's a tree yeah. line. They just stop. Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you. Water. So this is making me think of the, um, uh, Mario build reps, right? So, uh -huh. so the whole time we were doing that show, I was just like, how can you, like, how can we find another, uh, proxy Sure. Other than these structures, right? Because he's got this whole thing that he's he's looked at all the structures and they've got all their alignments and he's like, okay, we've got, you know, five points going down, you know, from north to south. So another proxy. We need would another be proxy, which would be the like lack of trees. The the in the sediment cores or whatever it, you know, as you dig down in the geological layers, are there is there evidence of like if you took his timeline where he's like, here's ice age, you know, interglacial, yeah. ice age, interglacial, you could then dig down in the sediment in those three or five points and see if you could find uh, correlating. Um, well, I guess that would have been all those places would have been the pole. Yeah. So that would be difficult to do. Yeah. You would just have to say like, well, you would just if you dig down, it would just be like, no. Right. There are no There's trees. There's nothing alive here. Yeah. Yeah. It was covered in ice but this but is it crosses greenland which is still covered it's in ice. still covered in ice yeah yes it's still covered in ice but he's talking about going back like two hundred and fifty thousand years or something like that right? yeah but it's it's the problem is, is it's, it's been crossing ice greenland the whole which is still ice now it's so, been ice the whole time yeah it's yeah like, right, so it's not gonna work yeah not gonna but work. but going with what hapgood is saying the other There's climatic the patterns regions follow yeah. it. Yeah, so you could go somewhere where yes. there was stuff, and you yeah. could like up where an was area, the circle of trees, an area that was moving into the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. that would be on the other side, on the other side of the of the North Pole. Yeah, if there's if it's not ocean. Yeah, so you find some place that that would have been moving into an Arctic Circle or out of an Arctic Circle in that timeline, and you dig and see if you can find that trees and things like that start appearing. Yeah. In correlation with that data, that would be an awesome way to oh, yeah, corroborate yes. his his data. Yeah. Martin, if you're listening, get on it, buddy. <laughs> 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 Go get some drill cores. That's I'm right. Sure that, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you might be able to find some in the in the literature already. Possibly. What time we got? Where are we at? Probably here? time for a break. Perfect time oh, for a man. break. Podcasting instincts are on point tonight. <laughs> All right. You're a professional. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back, folks. Snacks!
are back, folks. Gladly back from out of town. It's been a couple weeks since we did a show, That's at least. Right. So it's great to be back in the studio. Great to be going through the book again. Um, learning cool stuff, getting completely distracted by looking up stupid charts <laughs> while great facts are being dropped. New tunes. Should have had the watcher do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, something I made right before we left town. Yeah. All busted out the new keyboard. Almost all the bumper music is made in house, folks, here at the uh, Tangent Keep of Science by Kyle. My mm-hmm. job is to tell him which ones are cool. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if he walks in, I'm j- I just got it cranked up and he's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then I'm like, okay, it's going in the bumper <laughs> it's roll. It's going in the bumper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you haven't made one where I'm like, Come on, bro. <laughs> you need to take that one back to the woodshed, buddy. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Well, so, I, yeah, the, the the new keyboard busted it out. It's fully weighted. It's awesome. 88 keys, and it's got the and modules like, and stuff. demo. Record. <laughs> Push demo. <laughs> right. And then I walk in. I'm like, dude, that's epic. And you're like, right, bro? New bumper tune, buddy. No, come on. I made all that from scratch. I know. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, dude, that electric piano with that mod wheel. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. I just love it. All right. I set it to um, to go up a like two steps. When you bend the mod wheel all the way to the max, it bends the note up two steps. Two steps. Two full steps. When you bend the mod wheel all the way down to the max, it goes down a fifth. Oh. So five steps. So it like it it, it it you can set the mod wheel. You could make it go up an octave, right? Yeah. I've done that before. Modified but it's, mod wheel. Yeah, the pitch bend wheel, I should call it, but yeah, um, yeah it just really it just changes the instrument, it makes it as totally different, uh, pa- like all different kinds of patterns you can do. So anyway, yeah. back to geology. Yeah. So, in the following period, the Carboniferous, we have evidence summed up by Alfred Russell Wallace, whose name is also almost mine, <laughs> almost. <laughs> Co-author with Darwin of the theory of evolution, which makes me kind of feel weird. (laughs) In the Carboniferous formation, we again meet with plant remains and beds of true coal in the Arctic regions. Uh, Lepidodendrons and calamites, together with large spreading ferns, are found at Spitsbergen and at Bear Island in the extreme north of eastern Siberia. While marine deposits of the same age contain an abundance of large stony corals. In the Permian, following the Carboniferous, Colbert reports a find of fossil reptiles in what is now a bitterly cold region. Quote, large Permian reptiles are found along the Dvina River of Russia, just below the Arctic Circle, at a north latitude of 65 degrees. Colbert explains that these reptiles must have required a warm climate. In summing up the problem of plant life for the many long ages of the Paleozoic era, from the Devonian through the Permian, Barghorn says that it is, quote, one of the great enigmas of science, unquote. You think the dinosaurs were cold-blooded? I think they did think that for a while, but I don't think they, if they necessarily were... think that now, but it's not, there's no way to know. So they look sort of like reptiles, but maybe they had a bunch they're of feathers. They're also like birds, right? That's what I mean. They're, they're yeah. warm-blooded, so yeah. it'd be like a... Yeah, okay. There's lukewarm blooded. <laughs> there, the part way there. <laughs> Coming now to the Mesozoic, comprising the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, Colbert reports that in the Triassic, some amphibians, the labyrinthodonts, uh, ranged all the way from 40 degrees south latitude to 80 degrees north latitude. About this time, the warm water Ichthyosaurus lived at Spitsbergen. For the Jurassic, Wallace reports, in the Jurassic period, for example, we have proofs of a mild Arctic climate in the abundant plant remains of East Siberia and Amurland. But even more remarkable are the marine remains found in many places in high northern latitudes, among which we may especially mention the numerous ammonites and the vertebrae of huge reptiles of the genera Ichthyosaurus, and Teleosaurus found in Jurassic deposits of the Perry Islands at 77 degrees north latitude. For the Cretaceous period, A.C. Seward reported in 1932 that the commonest Cretaceous ferns of Greenland are closely allied to species in the southern tropics. So I'm just, I'm looking at the map here, and the 
75 degrees north latitude, like goes to the very top of Russia. Sure. Through the middle of Greenland. Mm. Um, way up in, I don't even know what it's called, way up there in Scandinavia. <laughs> with all the little dots. <laughs> you know, it's like still. Yeah, the Northern Islands in the Arctic big, Circle. Yeah. Yeah, it's still underwater. Right. Up there. Yeah. It's above Alaska. Yeah. So. That's so. Yeah, the heat, they're basically saying, "Well, we have tropical fern species in these areas." Yeah, that's that's wild. Gutenberg remarks: Thus, certain regions, such as Iceland or Antarctica, which are very cold now for the late Paleozoic or the Mesozoic era, show clear indications of what we would call subtropical climate today, but no trace of glaciation. At the same time, other regions were at least temporarily glaciated. This evidence, linked in this way with the problem of the ice ages we have already discussed, reveals the existence of a single problem. Ice ages in low latitudes and warm ages near the poles are, so to speak, the sides of a single coin. The correct explanation of one will probably involve the explanation of the other. Following the Cretaceous, the tertiary periods shows the same failure of the fauna and flora to observe our uh, current or present climatic zones. Scott, for example, says, The very rich floras from the Green River shales, from the Wilcox to the Gulf Coast and from the Eocene of Greenland, show that the climate was warmer than in the Paleocene and much warmer than today. In this Eocene epoch, we find evidence of warm climate in the north that is truly overwhelming. Captain Nares, or Nares, one of the early explorers of the Arctic, described a 25-foot seam of coal that he had thought was comparable in quality to the best Welsh coal, containing fossils similar to the Miocene fossils of Spitsbergen. He saw it near Watercourse Bay in northern Greenland. Closer examination revealed that it was, in reality, lignite. Remember when we were looking this up when we were going through the, um, I think it was earth and upheaval, but lig lignite is a soft brownish coal showing traces of plant structures intermediate between bituminous coal and peat. Yeah. So the watcher is pointing out about the dinosaurs there. If they were, they were gigantic and couldn't generate their own heat, they would have had to have absorb a lot of heat from the atmosphere, from, yeah. from the sun. Right. And the, the, on the other side of that same problem, people have pointed out, if they are warm-blooded and they're that huge, how do they cool off? Like, there's, Yeah, how do they dissipate that? Yeah, heat? how do yeah, you dissipate yeah. the So heat? they might yeah. live in northern climates. Could be, yeah. 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 So, uh, it was lignite. on those eggs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nevertheless, the contained fossils clearly indicated a climate completely different from the present climate of northern Greenland. The Grinnelland lignite indicates a thick peat moss with probably a small lake with water lilies on the surface of the water and reeds on the edges and birches and poplars and taxodias on the banks with pines, firs, spruce, elms, and hazel bushes on the neighboring hills. So this is not an Arctic tundra yeah. that we're talking about here. Br I mean, water lilies, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those require water, bro, <laughs> not ice. <laughs> <laughs> Ice dandelions. <laughs> Brooks thinks that the formation of peat bogs requires a rainfall of at least 40 inches a year and a mean temperature above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This suggests a very sharp contrast with the present Arctic conditions in Grinnelland. Durance and Felden, who did the paleontological work for Captain Nares, also mentioned a Miocene tree, the Swamp Cypress that flourished from central Italy all the way up to 82 degrees north latitude, that is, to within 500 miles of the pole. They show that the Miocene floras of Grinnelland, Greenland, and Spitsbergen all required temperate climatic conditions with plentiful moisture. They mention especially the water lilies of Spitsbergen, which would have required flowing water for the greater part of the year. In connection with the flora of Spitsbergen and the fauna mentioned earlier, it should be realized that the island is in polar darkness. So the island of Spitsbergen is in polar di darkness for half the year. It lies on the Arctic Circle as far north of Labrador as Labrador is north of Bermuda. 
Wallace describes the flora of the Miocene. He points out that in Asia and in North America, this flora was composed of species that apparently required a climate similar to that of our southern states. Yet it is also found in Greenland at 70 degrees north latitude, where it contained many of the same trees that were then growing in Europe. And he adds, But even farther north, in Spitsbergen, 78 degrees and 79 degrees north latitude, in one of the most barren and inhospitable regions on the globe, an almost equally rich fossil flora has been discovered, including several of the Greenland species and others peculiar, but most mostly of the same genera. There seem to be no evergreens here except coniferae, one of which is identical with the swamp cypress, now found living in the southern United States. There are also 11 pines, two libocedrus, two sequoias with oaks, poplars, birches, plains, limes, a hazel, an ash, and a walnut, also water lilies, pond weeds, and an iris, altogether about 100 species of flowering plants. Even in Grinnelland, within eight and one-fourth degrees of the pole, a similar flora existed. It has been necessary to dwell at length on the evidence of the warm polar climates because this is important for the discussion that follows. Part 3. Universal Temperate Climates, a Fallacy The evidence I have presented above, and a great deal more omitted for reasons of space, has long created a dilemma for geology. Only two practical solutions have offered themselves. One is to shift the crust, and the other is to suggest that climatic zones like the present ones have not always existed. It is often suggested that the climates have been very mild, virtually from pole to pole at certain times. The extent to which the latter theory is still supported is eloquent evidence of the theory of the permanence of the poles. When one inquires as to the evidence for the existence of such warm and moist climates, a peculiar situation is revealed. There is no evidence, except the fossil evidence, that this theory is supposed to explain. Could there be a better example of reasoning in a circle? So can you, exp can you explain that? Yeah. I'll, um, so he's basically saying there's two possibilities. One is that the, cr the crust shifts, and this explains like warm areas and what pull it right. The other one, which is the currently accepted and supported theory, is that there have been periods of, like we were talking about, like where all of the earth is basically, you know, nice and warm. And that explains why we can have flowering plants all the way up into the Arctic Circle now. And he says, but when you ask what the evidence for this is, the only evidence they have is the evidence they're trying to explain with the theory. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, that's not bad, but you need more than that. You don't come across evidence and say, okay, we need to explain this, and you come up with a theory, and then you can't say, find it. How do you explain that theory? And they right. say, because like, of the evidence. Right. The, yeah. Because of this stuff that we just explained with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Capgood says, can there be a better example of reasoning in a circle? Colbert cites evidence that the Devonian animals were spread all over the world, and then remarks that, therefore, quote, it is reasonable to assume that the Devonian period was a time of widely spread Equable climates, a period of uniformity over much of the Earth's surface, unquote. According to him, the same situation held true through the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic and even much later periods. Other paleontologists reasoned in the same way. Goldring, for example, remarked, quote, The Carboniferous plants had a worldwide distribution, suggesting rather uniform climatic conditions, unquote. She drew the same conclusions from the worldwide distribution of Jurassic flora. So is this theory of universal temperate climates inherently reasonable? The answer is that it is not. It involves, in the first place, ignoring the astronomical relations of the Earth and the Sun. The theory requires us to assume the existence of some factor powerful enough to negate the variation of the Sun's heat with latitude, which, of course, is due to the angle of inclination of the Earth's axis of rotation. As Professor George W. Bain of Amherst has pointed out, the result of this is that, quote, the thermal energy arriving at the Earth's surface per day per square centimeter averages 430 gram calories at the equator, but declines to 292 gram calories at the 40th parallel and to 87 
gram calories at the 80th. What force sufficiently powerful to counteract that fact of astronomy can be suggested and more important, supported by convincing evidence? So in other words, he's saying like this this violates. (laughs) Yes, it violates basic physics. Yeah, except that the Earth is flat. So it's totally explained that way. You're right. Dang. Well, book report over. (laughs) (laughs) It was thought at first that universal temperate climates might be accounted for by the theory of the cooling of the Earth. Those who favored this theory argued that since in earlier ages the Earth was hotter, the ocean water then evaporated much more rapidly and it formed thick clouds that reflected the sun's radiant energy back into space. The cloud blanket shut out the sun's radiation but kept in the heat that radiated from the earth itself and this acted to distribute the heat evenly over the globe the cloud blanket must have been thick enough to make the earth a dark dank and dismal place since as colbert shows fossils are found outside the present zones appropriate to them even in recent geological periods such conditions must have obtained during about 90 percent of the earth's whole history and most of the evolution of living forms must have taken place in them, in those conditions of darkness and yeah, yeah, nastiness. Yeah. For a number of reasons, including the difficulty of, how, of explaining how plants can have evolved in the polar regions without sunlight, this theory has been abandoned. We have also seen that the idea that the Earth was even hotter than now has recently been undermined. This has destroyed the dependability of the theory's basic assumption. The fact that the theory never was reasonable is shown from Coleman's arguments against it, advanced more than a quarter of a century ago. He pointed out that not only are ice ages known from the earliest periods, from the Precambrian, but there is evidence that some of these very ancient ice ages, ancient ice ages were even more intensely cold than the recent ice age that came to an end 10,000 years ago. No less than six ice ages are known from the Precambrian. The evidence of one of these Precambrian or Lower Cambrian Ice Ages is interestingly described by Brewster. Quote, In China, in the latitude of northern Florida, there is 170 feet of obvious glacial till, scratched boulders and all, and over it lie seafloor muds containing Lower Cambrian trilobites, the whole now altered to hard rock. Unquote. So... You get what he's pointing out there. Like, okay, if you're going to try to explain warm, temperate climate animals and and plants in very northern latitudes with a basically global warm earth, well, how do you have freaking ice ages during your global warm earth period? Right. Yeah. I used to be a big uh, proponent of, well, not proponent, but I, (laughs) I, I really like, used to think that was a great theory. What? That. That like there could be these periods of like this giant mm-hmm. cloud blanket, but it's hard to imagine that that would be self sustaining for very long. Like yeah. it, you know, yes, you can have the Earth covered in clouds for a long time, right? In that, yeah. But <clears throat> reflecting all that, all that light, you know, the right. Well, a full, increasing the albedo. A complete. Is that yes, much. you're right. That's what it is. A complete cloud blanket makes the Earth white and very reflective. Yeah. Yeah. So that it would cool down, and then in a moment it cools down, and you got rain. It's flooding. Yeah. Well, Everywhere. and they're trying to say, well, the Earth's own internal temperatures, uh, radiation, heat is keeping it warm yeah. in there because it like makes a blanket, right? So it's insulating. Yeah. But is that enough? And even then, that much cloud cover is just dark. Right. That's going to be dark. Yeah. It's really dark. So you'd have yeah you, the the plants the plant life should. Uh, reflect that. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> finger guns. That one needed finger guns. <laughs> okay, so right in China, there's so he's just pointing out a couple things like this. China one is an example of glacial till in the Cambrian. So it is obvious that such ice ages and evidences of more of them are frequently coming to light are in conflict with the theory of universal equable climates. Some of them are found right in the midst of periods thought to have been especially warm, such as the Carboniferous. Coleman presents other geological evidence against the theory. 
the fact that most of the fossils found are those of warm climate creatures is, he thinks, misleading. Plants and animals are more easily fossilized in warm, moist climates than they are in cold, arid ones. Fossilization, even under the most favorable conditions, is a rare accident. I think this is a big point. We've made this multiple times on the podcast, but like fossilization is the exception. It's like a, an exceptional circumstance. Right. Now, it's weird that I don't, I'm not quite on board with this. Like they're more easily fossilized in warm, moist climates. No. Cold, arid ones that are seems like more likely to it mummifies, gets trapped in ice, maybe ends up fossilized like or in a desert. You know, there's no moisture. It just you, the, the body just turns into a, a mummy and then it could get buried in sand and then it fossilizes. But in a moist environment, it just should rot and just disappear. I don't know. Maybe peat bogs would preserve it. Yeah. The only argument I would have <clears throat> to support warm environments for fossilization is flooding. Okay, because it buries Flooding, everything. It buries right? you and stuff, and yeah. then you get, and then you end up like way under the under the gravel beds, yeah, that are anaerobic and okay. can be preserved in that way, right? Okay, and I guess ocean fo- makes tons of fossils. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. So I guess you would call the but bottom yeah, of the ocean a moist environment. I know that's that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's kind of weird because it should be. I, I think wa- it would be better to say warm climates are better for fossilization, okay. but warm. You know, yeah, warm enough for there to be flowing yeah. water. Yeah. But yeah, uh, uh, you're right too. I mean, like, free. Like, I would say this is up for debate. Yeah. But the tundra or the, like, the Siberian tundra, whatever, they dig up, you know, all these mammoth bones and stuff. Yeah. They were entrained in sedimentary layers from flooding. Right. And water and everything. And, and water. It freezes. Now it's frozen. Fun. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Oh, what about the desert? What man? about burning? <laughs> 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 what if everything is on fire? Coal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Fossilization, even under the most favorable conditions, is a rare accident. The fauna dynamic. And... Okay, that's that's it. Dynamic. Yeah. Situations Di- is where you would yes, end up because it has to you, be extremely dynamic. Yeah, you have yeah. to have you know large movements, movements of stuff. Of, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right, you have to take the animal or whatever it is out of its normal environment, which would just sort of take it apart, right? All the animal, all the other things alive that would eat it and sort of predate on it. Right. You have to take it out of that environment or destroy that environment and then cover it in sediments that are <coughs> anaerobic, like you were saying. So fire, um, vol- volcanism, all these dynamic, mm-hmm. you know, flooding, all that kind of stuff is what causes fossilization, yeah. right? Yeah, energetic yeah. events. The fauna and flora of the temperate and arctic zones of the past were seldom preserved. Thus, while the finding of fossils of warm climate organisms all over the Earth is an argument against the permanence of the present arrangement of the climatic zones, it is not an argument for universal mild climates. I want to continue this point, though. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. No, it's fine. The other problem with cold climates is that there's nothing alive there to fossilize. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Only people walk up onto glaciers and get stuck <laughs> at them, right, yeah. <laughs> like like Utsi. <laughs> was that was that too soon? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, what is Watcher saying? Ice preserves flesh, which isn't conducive to fossilization. I don't know because mm. we we really like look up the word fossilize f- like fossil. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, turned to stone. Yeah, lithified right. is a, is different. Yeah. Fossilization is preserved. Yeah. In, in some kind of sedimentary layer. So it could be ice. You could yeah. be fossilized in ice, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another argument against such climates may be based upon the evidences of desert conditions in all geological periods. These imply worldwide variations in climate and humidity. Both Brooks and Umgrove stress the importance of this evidence. One of the most famous formations of Britain, the Old Red Sandstone, is apparently nothing but a fossil desert. Man, that's really cool. Yeah, I know. That's really cool. That's crazy. Coleman points to innumerable varved deposits in many geological periods as evidence of... A varve is a... a Lake sediment. It's a layer that indicates a year in in the bottom of a lake. Right. 
varved deposit, innumerable varved deposits in many geological periods as evidence of seasonal changes, right? You don't have a varv without changes seasonal to season, changes, yeah. which of course imply the existence of climatic zones. Ample evidence of the existence of strongly demarcated climatic zones through the Earth's whole history, at least since the beginning of the deposition of the sedimentary rocks, comes from other sources. Barghorn cites the evidence of fragments of fossil woods from late Paleozoic deposits in the Southern Hemisphere that show pronounced ring growth indicating seasons. He also points out that in the Permo-Carboniferous period, floras existed that were adapted to very cold climate. So I just, I want to point out too, and keep this in mind as we go through, that indications all the way back to the very earliest fossils we can find, like tree stuff that have, or even lake sediments that have varves, indicate, indicative of seasons, implies that the axial tilt of the earth has been there since yeah, the beginning yeah, yeah, yeah. of life. Gotcha. Because, wow. like, no matter how you move the crust around, really good point. you got that tilt, it changes the seasons. the seasons of the yeah. year. Great point. Yeah. Huh. Wrong, watcher. <laughs> he says fossilization is a general reference to bone remains. How do you get fossil flowers? Right. Fossil pollen. Yeah. Fossil leaves. Right. Come on, bro. Fossil jellyfish, buddy. <laughs> he says ice, ice preserves flesh, which is more along to mummification. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I probably agree with I that. I can agree with that. First, first thing is totally wrong though, which is which is great. <laughs> He's furiously. Typing. He's furiously typing. Brett is furiously typing. That's what it says. I guess the dots are moving faster. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Colbert himself reports good evidence of seasons in the Cretaceous period in the form of fossils of deciduous trees. Umgrove. Cites the geologist Barry, who states that the fossilized woods from six geological periods from the Devonian to the Eocene show well-marked annual rings indicating seasons like those of the present time. Furthermore, Barry goes on to say, detailed comparisons of these Arctic floras with contemporary floras from lower latitudes show unmistakable evidence for the existence of climatic zones. Brooks concludes on the basis of Barry's evidence that climatic, z climatic zones existed in the Eocene. And Ralph W. Cheney, after a study of the fossil floras of the tertiary period from the Eocene to the Pliocene, concluded that climatic zones existed during that entire period. The distinguished meteorologist, meteorologist W. J. Humphreys, whose fundamental work, The Physics of the Air, remains a classic, remarked in 1920 that there was no good evidence of the absence of climatic zones at any time from the beginning of the geological record. Finally, Dr. C. C. Nikforoff, an expert on soils, both contemporary and fossil, has stated that in all geological times, there were cold and warm, humid and dry climates, and their extremes presumably did not change much throughout geological history. So we will return below to the significance of fossil soils and present other evidence showing per, uh, persistence of sharply demarcated climatic zones during the Earth's whole history. But where, at this point, does the evidence leave us? On the one hand, the evidence shows that the plants and animals of the past were distributed without regard to the present direction of the climatic zones. I have been unable to do more than suggest the immensity of the body of evidence supporting this conclusion. On the other hand, the attempt to deny the existence in the past of sharply demarcated climatic zones like those of the present has failed. It may even be said to have failed sensationally. There is no scrap of evidence for it except the evidence it is supposed to explain. While on the other hand, it is in contradiction with both the fundamentals of astronomy and the preponderance of the geological facts. So he's again, he's talking about I just, yeah. they're denying that there were ancient, like to say that it was a one snowball. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> to say that it was a snowball or just a generally warm everywhere is to deny climatic zones yes in a particular time and he's saying the preponderance of evidence that these zones existed yeah uh uh what's the word like at the same time yeah 
So you go back to a layer that's so many, however old, and in this period, yeah. and you find frozen areas, you find warm areas, you find all the climatic zones. Yeah, you zones. find deserts, you find yes. swamps, <clears throat> you find cold, you pl places where there's ice and places yeah, where there's yeah, where yeah. it was tropical. The problem is, is it just doesn't match the current poles, and that's why they're trying to explain it away. Yeah. But to, to say that there was ice ball earth and or totally warm summery earth permanent is to not only ignore basic physics and astronomical alignments and 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 cycles but also all of the geological evidence itself the only evidence for this explanation is the evidence that the explanation is supposed to explain yeah yeah <laughs> everything else is against it <laughs> that's great that's why it's like yeah. i'm just saying he just destroys that yeah all right, from the Dictionary of Geological Terms, third uh, edition, prepared yes. by American Geological Institute by Robert L. Bates and Julia A. Jackson. Fossil. Any remains, trace, or imprint of a plant or animal that has been preserved in the Earth's crust since some past geologic or prehistoric time, loosely any evidence of past life. Okay. No mention of bones. Right. Or stone. Poop <laughs> preserved in earth. Boneless <laughs> is a fossil. Coprolites. Coprolites. <laughs> Gotta take a break. All right. We'll be right back. Poop. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast second half of the show third segment still going through charles hapgood's path of the pole and uh where were we i actually didn't prepare to start this so on the one hand no i read that Okay, so we are left with a clear-cut conclusion. Climatic zones have always existed, but they have followed different paths on the face of the Earth. If changes in the position of the axis of rotation of the Earth and of the Earth upon its axis are equally impossible, and if the theory of continental drift provides no satisfactory solutions for reasons already discussed in Chapter 1, then we are forced to the conclusion that the surface of the Earth must often have been shifted over the underlying layers. Part four, the Eddington Pauli suggestion. Another suggestion for displacements of the Earth's crust, to which I have already referred, is that of Carl A. Pauli, who has contributed new lines of evidence in support of such shifts. He has based his theory on Eddington's suggestion that the Earth's crust may have been gradually shifted through time by the effects of tidal friction. The evidence for displacements presented by Pauli is most impressive. Pauli finds from a study of the elevations above sea level of the terminal moraines of mountain glaciers, right? So the terminal moraines are, would be the lines of hills and deposits <coughs> indicating the furthest extent of a glacial lobe. So the terminal... This, so the elevations above sea level of the terminal moraines of mountain glaciers in all latitudes, that there is a correlation of elevation with the latitude. Very interesting. Wait a second now. There is a correlation the elevation... of the level above sea level of terminal moraines to with the latitude that they're found at. While it is true that many factors influence the distance a mountain glacier may extend downward towards sea level, latitude is one of them. And by using a sufficient number of cases, it is possible to average out the other factors and arrive at the average elevation of mountain glacier moraines above sea level for each few degrees of latitude from the equator toward the poles. So if you go, let's say you find terminal moraine... In the northern United States, 
It'll be closer to sea level than farther south. And if we go south, it's it's higher. Yeah, elevation. it has to be higher elevation in general. Yeah, because it's colder, right, up higher. Oh, okay. Yes, that makes sense. I, I get it. I yeah. Get it. I was I'm trying to I was comparing this to like okay wait a minute like if we're talking about moraine created from a mountain glacier that was once in the northern latitude like that it had shifted towards the southern or like not northern in the polar regions mm-hmm. that it had shifted towards a these are mountain region. glaciers that exist now right gotcha yes that that makes perfect so then sense. you so you find other moraines that are from far back geological epochs and you say well uh, in its current place it can't be this low yeah, low got it that's, yeah that's where i was going with it. Yeah, yeah yeah wow that's a really great i know what a cool uh, thing dang. to look at yeah so this gives us a curve that makes it possible to compare the elevations of the terminal moraines of mountain glaciers that existed during the pleistocene epoch there we go Polly finds that these moraines do not agree with the curve indicating unmistakably a displacement of the crust how far Pleistocene Epoch. We're talking 2.8 million years or something yeah. at the max? Yeah. Pauli cites another impressive line of evidence in support of displacements of the One, lithosphere. 1.6 on this. I thought it was older than that. Uh, sorry. He has compared the locations of the coal deposits of several geological periods, many of which are now in polar regions, with the locations of ice caps for the same periods. He lists 34 coal deposits regarded as of Jurassic Liassic age and 17 of Triassic Phaetic age and finds that if it is assumed that the centers of the ice caps of that time were located at the poles, then these coal deposits would have been located within or just outside the tropics as would be correct. He says... The very definite location of these coal deposits within the Triassic, Jurassic, tropical, and subtropical zones cannot be mere coincidence. The distribution indicates that the lithosphere has shifted. Of the permo-carboniferous coal deposits, very widely distributed over the Earth, he says that 95 out of 105 listed in the coal resources of the world lie within or just outside of the tropics as determined by the assumption that the North or South Pole lay under the center of one of the permocarboniferous ice sheets. That's really interesting. So like these coal deposits from these geological ages, which are in anomalous areas now, but if you find simp- the, where the ice sheets were for those time periods and you put those at the pole, then it puts the coal deposits at the, at the tropical mm-hmm. places. So I just had this, I, I've had this whole mental picture playing out because we were, uh, I can't remember, the, the first episode or something, we were talking about how the, one of the geologists or whatever was talking about how the seabed, like at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, it's like really thin crust or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like just stripped of any. Yeah, there's not a lot of sediment. It's not basically a lot of sed- just the top of the magma. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And then you got the rifts, right? So if it's. Yeah. And then, because what he was just saying I think was that this is evidence that like these, these layer, the layers on the continents are just being shoved over top of each other. So I was thinking about the seabeds spreading out from this, you know, the Pacific and all those, you know, in the Atlantic. Yeah. And it's just literally like curling the continents over top of one another. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the idea that it could happen fast enough to create a giant bed of coal like 25 feet thick. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. To think about. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. And it's sh- like like so whatever sediment that the sea that the ocean is collecting now will be shoved up onto the mm-hmm. land. Yeah. On top of existing like like current trees and stuff. So it's like really confusing. Yeah. It would be confusing to future geologists yeah digging down and finding ocean sediments then you go through that and there's like basalt layers it's confusing now that's what i mean we live on ocean sediments we're like what is this doing here yeah you're on ocean sediments you go down far enough and then you hit basalt yeah and then you go through that and then you get to granite yeah you know or whatever (laughs) but you might come in on a coal bed somewhere yes yeah a coal seam coal in the midst of stuff yeah and you're like right okay random peat bog so in other words the ocean sediments 
could be older than the coal bed that's way down underneath the basalt. Could be. Because yeah. if there was some catastrophic motion that shoved that where the ocean had, say, been building up these sedimentary layers for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, and then that was just shoved up over top of a forest. Yeah. And then that turns into a coal bed. Yeah. That forest is actually younger than the ocean sediments that are yeah. through a basalt layer and then sitting on top of it. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. That's wild to think about. So part five, the contribution of George W. Bain. Professor Bain has gone considerably beyond the categories of evidence that we have so far discussed. He has considered the specific chemical processes controlled by sunlight and varying according to latitude and the remnant chemicals typical of soils developed in the different climatic zones. He has extended this sort of analysis also to marine sediments. I think this is really interesting. Bain's approach to the problem has many advantages. It circumvents, for one thing, the argument that plants of the past may have been adjusted to climates different from those which their modern descendants live. He begins with a precise definition of each climatic zone in terms of the quantities of the sun's heat reaching the Earth's surface. He points out that, as is known, the seasonal variation of this heat increases with distance from the equator. He then describes the global wind pattern resulting from this distribution of the sun's energy, defining clearly the conditions of the horse latitudes in which most of the Earth's deserts are found. The horse latitudes, I think, are within 30 degrees of the equator. Okay. Uh, and the meteorology of the polar fronts. He shows that there are distinct and different complete chemical cycles in each of these areas and corresponding cycles in the sea. Many of the chemical compounds produced in each of these areas are included naturally in the rocks formed from the sediments, and they remain as permanent climatic records. So he doesn't even have to look at fossils. He's looking at the chemical composition of the sediments that are now formed into rocks, and he's basically saying that we can look at how the chemical this, this works now, and then we can look for the, you know, you could say, okay, this is, this is how it forms in this climatic zone, and it's all based on how much energy is reaching the surface yeah, yeah. of the Earth. And then you can use those same criteria to identify past climatic zones, right, in the bands of ancient rock. And oh, it doesn't matter what cool. the fossils show. So it is impossible because of limitations of space to do justice to Bain's comprehensive approach to this question. He establishes that great differences exist between the mineral components of the rocks in different climatic zones, resulting from the difference in the amount of the sun's radiant heat. With regard to the polar soils, he found that they are developed in circles on the Earth's surface rather than in bands. Temperate and tropical soils are, of course, found in bands since the zones are bands that encircle the Earth. So this guy's like one of the coolest ge geologists ever. He studies ancient rock bands, <laughs> bro. <laughs> ancient rock bands are determining polar shift. Yeah. It is clear that Bain has established a sound method for the study of the climates of the past. He has applied his method to the study of the climates of five periods, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, Devonian, and Permian. So well, just to go back to this, he's, he's saying that the Arctic, sorical, the Arctic soils are circular. Yes. You can find yeah. the chemical compositions <clears throat> in a circle because it's this on the is, pole. This is, this is awesome. Right. Because and then the other moves, climate, Yeah. Yeah, the other ones are... If you in find band. a big Arctic circle down on the equator now in yeah. an ancient... In you an find ancient, all those chemical yeah. compositions And then you find bands pattern. going around in a circle on the other side. That's, That's the... Yes. That's freaking awesome. Wow. <laughs> Science! So he's uh, Cambrian, Ordovician, Sil Silurian, Devonian, and Permian with significant results. And he concludes first that climatic zones representing the different distributions of solar heat existed in those periods just as at present. This is proved by the specific remnant chemicals included in these rocks, which differ exactly as do the sediments of the different zones at the present time. This is, of course, fatal for the theory of universal, equable climates. His second conclusion is that the directions of the climatic zones have changed enormously in the course of time. He finds the equator running through the new Siberian islands in the Arctic Ocean 
and uh, in the Permocarboniferous period and North and South America lying tandem along it. The evidence he uses seems to establish his essential point and ours that the climatic zones themselves have shifted their positions on the face of the earth. Or to put it another way, the climatic zones remain the same relative to the axis of rotation, but that the entire lithosphere has moved around and thus put the bands in different places, right. circles and bands. Bain has drawn some uh, interesting further conclusions. He states that the Earth's crust must have been displaced over the interior layers and that fixity of the axis of the Earth relative to the elastic outer shell is just not valid. He points to the fossil evidence of the cold zones distributed in circular areas and says, the recurrent change in position of these rings through geologic time can be accounted for now only on the basis of change in the position of the elastic shell of the Earth relative to its axis of rotation. That's freaking... And then that's... in the book, Hapgood includes multiple maps from the different periods showing where this guy found different bands. bands. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> Ancient rock bands, Ancient bro. rock bands. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> On tour. <laughs> Worldwide tour of <clears throat> ancient rock bands. Professor Bain and the ancient rock bands. <laughs> 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 even without the evidence of geomagnetism, or even if that evidence should someday be discredited, the evidence produced by Bain would be sufficient to establish the truth of displacements of the lithosphere. However... The mechanism, he suggests, does not seem satisfactory. He depends upon the effects of erosion. He points out that at the present time, the balance of the sediment transfer by rivers is toward the equator. The mass thus added to the lithosphere on the equator has been given increased velocity by the fact of being moved equatorward. Equator word. This is this word again <laughs> that I don't know how to say. Equator toward word. the equator. Equator word. <laughs> equator word. And this would tend to accelerate the rotation. But the gyroscopic effect of this, he thinks, would be to cause the rotating globe to precess in a direction at 90 degrees to the direction of the rotation. The crust alone, however, not the entire globe would be shifted. I don't understand that. It doesn't seem right. And I think Hapgood agrees. That, but he's basically saying it, the, in general, erosion is moving stuff towards the equator from both the south and the north. Right, all mo yeah, rivers all are the flowing towards the, the equator in general. So it's just moving all this material, and then you end up with a thicker and thicker band of stuff. And this would somehow tend to like turn the lithosphere. I don't know. I don't know how it works. But Hapgood says well, there's. I was thinking about this too because, I mean, shouldn't that make it more gyroscopically stable? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But so so um, just thinking about what the the what's the easiest thing to move around? It's the water. So let's say you have an ice age, like this seems to be the most volatile time for the crust because you got the ice build up mm. and then the ice has a slump, right? It can only stack up so high before it slumps and, yeah, and moves out. stuff out. Yeah. Well, that pushing out is not going to be uniform because of the sure. terrain. Yeah, yeah. So you'll get large the amounts slopes, of ice yeah. building up and sort of like you're taking the oceans of the world and dropping them four or 500 feet down putting all of that mass at the poles and then slumping it out in an in an uh irregular irregular or uneven pattern. Yeah. yeah. Then and but it's landlocked it's locked into the pattern of the of the underlying right. bedrock. Yeah. Now you have a mechanism for forcing or right like you'll get incredible like geological pressure and you know then you get volcanism <clears throat> and once you get that you know, earthquakes and stuff, and you start the vibration going, then maybe you can dislodge yeah. the whole thing. I think that the argument against that, and Hapgood even <clears throat> goes to it here with the movement of sediments, is that isostasy, the it ice... compensates for that. Yes. We talked about that last right. time. So the ice sinks in, and material beneath the lithosphere flows towards the equator to compensate, and everything sort of balances out. But the problem with that... It just depends the, on how fast the ice the, sheets build up. The problem with that is, is that the, the slumping of the ice can move... Faster the than mass, uh, like a lot come. of mass, quite quite fast. Yeah, yeah, right. Yep. So you could shove all this ice down in this one thing, and then you've got this whole. Yep. And and of course the ice trillions of tons of ice off off center. The yep. isostasy is doing multiple things because we talked about this. Like when you when you 
because this magma is viscous. Yeah. And it's it's got a bunch of dissolved gases and all this stuff. And so when you 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 put a lot of pressure on it, you're you're uh, it's got plasticity and and viscosity. Right. And yeah. it's it's say then now you've got these under under crust rivers of magma moving out from underneath this isostatic pressure coming down. Yeah. And therefore that's pulling on that's pulling stuff, but it's yeah. also it's so it's got a drag. Yeah. But also if it comes to a, a weak point. Then you have magma flows, perhaps coming sure. out of these okay. places, right? Yeah. Um, and then it's already too complicated. Well, the, the other thing is that <laughs> you can get explosive because of the like. Once you get that release of pressure, then all the gases, yep, flow yep. out, and then you Come get these out. big explosions and stuff. Yep. And I don't know. I'm just I'm thinking of all okay, the processes. Okay. Well, the explosions made it cool. Explosions. Yep. <laughs> <They're> always... <laughs> I was getting bored until you put explosions in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Hapgood says, there seem to me to be three objections to this mechanism. In the first place, it seems probable that isostatic adjustment of the lithosphere to the transfer of sediments would eliminate this effect. A poleward flow of material under the lithosphere would roughly equal the, the equatorward movement of sediment. A second objection is that there is no reason to suppose that with every position of the lithosphere, the balance of sediment transfer would be toward the equator. This would require changes in the drainage systems of all the continents with each shift of the crust. The third objection is that the geomagnetic evidence suggests polar shifts were far more frequent than indicated by Bain, and Bain makes no use of the continental drift hypothesis. So, basically, Bain's looking at soil composition to determine, you know, old equa uh, rock bands. Yeah, rock bands is really cool, but his mechanism, Hapgood says, is not satisfactory. Part six, the contribution of TYH Ma. Bain has pointed out that among other indications of latitude, sea crustaceans and corals may indicate latitude either by the presence or absence of evidence of seasonal variations in growth. It happens that corals have been very thoroughly investigated from precisely this point of view. By a remarkable parallelism of development, another theory of displacement of the Earth's crust took shape on the opposite side of the Earth at about the same time that Mr. Campbell and I started on our project. Professor Ting Ying H. Ma, an oceanographer, then at the University of Fujian, China, came to the conclusion, after many years of study of fossil corals, that many total displacements of the Earth's lithosphere must have taken place. I did not become aware of Ma's work until I was introduced to it by David B. Erickson of the Lamont Geological Observatory in 1954. Erickson has, in fact, taken a leading role in introducing Ma's work to American scientists. For about 20 years previous to the time I mentioned, Ma had intensively pursued the study of living and fossil reef corals. He very early noticed the special characteristic of reef corals referred to by Bain, but hitherto ignored by writers on corals. He saw that at distances from the equator, there were seasonal differences in the rates of coral growth and that the evidences of these were preserved in the coral skeleton. Specifically, he observed that in winter, the coral cells are smaller and denser, and in summer they are larger and more porous. Together, these two rings make up the growth for one year. Studying living coral reefs in various parts of the Pacific, comparing, measuring, and tabulating coral specimens of innumerable species, making photographic studies of the coral skeletons, Ma established that the rates of total annual coral growth for identical or similar species within the range of the coralline seas increased with proximity to the equator, and that seasonal variation in growth rates increased with distance from the equa equator. Other writers on corals have sense, yeah. yeah, other writers on corals have pointed out that there are numerous individual exceptions and irregularities in coral growth rates deriving from the fact that the coral polyps feed upon floating food which may vary in quantity from place to place from day to day and even from hour to hour. Ma, however, has guarded himself against error by a quantitative and statistical approach. In several published volumes of coral studies, he has compiled... So this dude has written multiple books on this topic. 
just looking at Coral. He has compiled tables running into hundreds of pages, and his studies have involved thousands of measurements. When this indefatigable oceanographer had worked out the relations of coral growth with latitude, he possessed an effective tool with which to investigate the climates of the past. He studied specimens of fossil corals from many geological periods, and he devoted separate volumes and more books <laughs> to the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Cretaceous, and the Tertiary periods. As did, he, did he find a correlation? <laughs> hey, <laughs> more finger guns. <laughs> <laughs> As Ma assembled the coral data for these periods, it became clear that the total width of the coralline seas had not varied noticeably from the beginning of the geological record. Not only was the existence of seasons in the oldest geological periods clearly indicated, it was also indicated that the average temperatures of the respective zones were about the same as present. The second result of Ma's studies was to establish that the, that the positions of the ancient coralline seas and, therefore, of the ancient equators were not the same as at present. They had evidently changed from one geological period to another. Ma first believed that this could be explained by the theory of drifting continents. Down to about 1949, he sought to fit all the evidence into that theory. But by 1949, the accumulated evidence forced him to adopt a theory of total displacements of all the outer shells of the Earth over the liquid core. By an instinct of conservatism, however, he did not abandon the theory of floating continents, but combined it with the new theory. Ma's coralline seas ran in all directions. One of his equators actually bisected the Arctic Ocean, but he had great difficulty in matching up his equators on different continents. If, for example, he traced an equator across North America, he could not match it with an equator for the same period on the other side of the Earth to make a complete circle of the Earth. He therefore supposed that the continents themselves had been shifting independently, and this had had the effect of throwing the ancient equators out of line. He therefore allowed for each period enough continental drift to bring the equators into line, and it seemed when he did this that in successive geological periods he did have increasing distances between the continents as if the drift had been continuous. Subsequently, Ma developed his theory into a complete system, which is most interesting, and yet to which I think serious objections may be raised. Corals are, according to Ma, excellent indicators for the climate of the time in which they grew. But by the nature of the case, since corals grow only in shallow water and grow upwards only as far as the surface, the period of time represented by a single fossil coral reef is of the order of a few thousand years only, as compared with the millions of years embraced by a geological period. So I think that's really interesting. They don't generally grow in water deeper than 100 feet. Right. And they can only grow from there to the surface. Right. Right? After that, it must they have to just expand. They can't get taller. So you don't really get layers anymore. So that makes them not necessarily, the skeletons in any case, not necessarily a, a long record right. in terms of geological time. So how short the continuous growth of a coral reef may be is indicated by numerous studies of the coral reefs of the Pacific. A.G. Mayer, for example, says, quote, The modern reefs, now constituting the atolls and barriers of the Pacific, could readily have grown upward to sea level from the floors of submerged platforms since the close of the last glacial epoch, so 10,000 years. Right. At... Pago Pago Harbor, borers borings were made down to the basalt underlying the reef, and after estimates of the growth rates were arrived at, the age of the reef was estimated at 5,000 years. When these spans are compared with those of entire geological periods of the order of 20 million or 30 million years, it is clear how fragile must be any conclusions based on the assumption that a given coral reef in Europe was contemporary with another one in North America. It is quite impossible in the present state of our knowledge to decide that they were, in fact, contemporary. Hmm. Okay. This means that Ma's corals, for a period like the Devonian, may be indications of different equators that existed at different times during that period of four, 40 million years. Therefore, it is obvious that thousands of coral specimens would be required to give any certainty as to the actual climatic history of an entire geological period. 
Very possibly, Ma could have avoided combining the two different theories, the slipping shell of the Earth and the drifting of continents, if he had supposed a sufficiently frequent slipping of the crust. So it's interesting, like, he brings up these researchers and it shows, like, they did all this amazing work and then eh, they kind of don't, maybe they don't put it together quite right or, like, Hapgood doesn't think they put the story together quite right because he's like, well, Ma's evidence is awesome, but they're little tiny snippets of time right. for these massive geological so you can't, ages. you can't go along and say, well, here's a ring right. that was in this zone because you can't necessarily connect. Right, because that, that one lasted 5,000 years, this one lasted 10,000, whatever, and you're talking about a time period that's 40 million years long, so you can't really connect them that way. But I wouldn't want to quarrel with the guy. But... <laughs> you don't want to quarrel with his correlations? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, folks, I'm reading all this science. Kyle's just sitting there thinking of this joke. That's his job. So true. <laughs> He's like, when can I say this? What else can I come up with? <laughs> Quarreling. <laughs> <laughs> I see, maybe he quarreled with his ma. <laughs> yeah. lot, ma! <laughs> Meatloaf! <laughs> Part seven, on the rate of climatic change. Studies appear from time to time in which attempts are made to trace climatic changes in spe uh, specified areas over periods of, periods of millions of years. In one of these, the conclusion is reached that there was a gradual cooling of the climate during a great many million years of the tertiary period. It is true that no s cause of such a progressive cooling can be pointed to, Neither is there any explanation as to why the climatic change had to be so gradual. It is simply assumed that the climatic change had to be gradual and that the cause of the change had to be such as to explain gradual changes. It is important to define the evidence on which these conclusions are based. In the example I am considering, the facts are as follows. A. The period of time involved is of the order of 30 million years. B. Wherever reference is made to the specific strata of rock selected for analysis of cl climatic evidence consisting of c included fossils, it is clear that the time required for the deposition of any particular layer was of the order of 10,000 years. C. It follows that during the 30 million years, it would have been possible to have about 3,000 different layers of sedimentary rock. D. A vast majority of these layers cannot be sampled, either because they no longer exist or because they do not contain fossils or simply because of the amount of work involved. E. As a result, only spot checking is possible. Perhaps a dozen strata out of 3,000 may be studied, and from these it must be obvious that no dependable climatic record can be established. F. Even with the unsatisfactory spot checking so far attempted, reversals of climatic trends have been observed. And G, climatic conditions indicated by a layer of sediments deposited during a brief period of time in one location cannot be assumed to indicate the direction of climatic change over a great region or over the whole Earth. It seems quite as reasonable to suppose that climatic change in other regions at the same time could have been in a different direction. Furthermore, it cannot be assumed that two sedimentary deposits in different areas are of the same age because they both indicate climatic change in the same direction. So it may be concluded that claims for gradual climatic changes in the same direction over long periods of time and over great areas are unsupported by convincing evidence. They are supported by no reasonable hypothesis we are left free to conclude that climatic change may have taken place in relatively short periods of time and possibly in opposite directions at the same time as the consequence of displacements of the lithosphere. Wow. So we just, this whole show made it through chapter three. <laughs> God. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> We're getting there, folks. I promise. Oh, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> but it's great, dude. Yeah, this I mean, really so cool. fantastic. <clears throat> he like, he like, you know, he gets me all, I'm just totally buying it. And then he starts slamming all the ideas. I know. Yeah. You're like, like oh, wow, shit. this is awesome. This guy's got, okay, maybe he yeah, doesn't man, totally. It's not yeah, that maybe he's not, he's not really doing it right. <laughs> I sold it. <laughs> I'm buying it again. Yeah. <laughs> sold. <clears throat> okay. Watcher, Watcher says you need to corral my jokes. Hey, right. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Break time. <laughs> 
<laughs> end these jokes. Stay. For the final segment, ladies and gentlemen, ha. brothers Didn't even have my podcast. headphones on. wasn't ready. Oh yeah, sorry about uh, that. Oh yeah, just hits the record button. Just roll, bro. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, this calls for a beer. Oh yeah, just call for a beer. Sure, I'll have a beer. So yeah, well, like we said at the beginning, we're back from the Scablands. Uh, this is trip season for us. So Kyle's actually going right back out of town. He's a uh, beach bound. Going fishing, folks. Yeah. Taking the family. I'm going to have like two whole weeks all to myself. Yeah, R- Russ's vacation is <laughs> everyone is leaving. <laughs> everyone is gone. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Cheers, man. <sighs> yeah. Freshy. Yeah. Yeah, so this is trip season. So we did the Scablands. Um, Kyle's going to the beach. Egypt is coming up. Uh, there's other things in the works, folks. We're going to keep you guys updated on We're, you know, we're, uh, we're working together with Ben. I really love that dude, Ben from Uncharted oh, he's, X. He's, he's so solid, great. Yeah. Um, and we got to meet his wife on this trip. Shout out to, uh, Sherelle Rel over there. Uh, What's up? it was great to meet you. And, uh, yeah, so we're working with Ben on future trips for 2023 schedule. So we'll be keeping you guys updated on what's going on there. Uh, we were looking at several different places uh, to go look at ancient mysteries. Um, what else we got? Uh, is there an ag update at all? I fed the bees. They were probably <laughs> starving. <laughs> Poor bees. Yeah. Um, let's see. But hey, what? They're full of honey. Oh. I mean, like, they're honey. I opened the hives and I was like, oh my God, you guys are like. Wow, kicking they're kicking, some ass. Okay, they're finally kicking into yeah, gear. Yeah, like really I, just... I pulled the top of one of the hives off. And they're getting strong. Like, this thing weighs a ton. It's full. Wow, like, I can't even pick it up. That's a cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think they're doing well. And, they, and the queen excluders recovered. are in there, so it's just all honey. There's no brood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. dude. <laughs> I know. Might have to take some. I, I, but, I popped it off there, and like you know, they, they'll, they'll connect those two things, and you, yeah, can, yeah. I just, there's just honey, and I was like, oh my god. Golden nectar, but of what the we really, gods. what we really want to do is uh, is harvest it when like like stop feeding them in the spring. Yeah, right. That's and, right. And then right, the, the honey in this is is much we're lighter. Trying, yeah, we're trying to build the hives so we're feeding them. Sure, and you don't, yeah, and, and we moved them. It's and not as good. A honey. Freaked them out and right. So that's why I was feeding them all summer. Let we them had, have it. We had the we moved them and we had the drought, so they were kind of freaking out. But I've just I'm proud of them, dude. They've they're loaded. They're ready for winter. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, the the wine made it through malolactic fermentation, uh, so yes. I put the first dose of preservative in there, which is sulfur dioxide. A naturally occurring compound in wine, but we also add it to bring up the parts per million to a point to that will uh, scrub oxygen, so protect it from oxidation, and also... Bacterial spoilage, which uh, our wines are pretty high pH. Just got some samples back oh, from yeah. the lab, and <laughs> the cab is three point nine nine. So it's like too high. you know, three point six, three point seven is good. Uh, three point eight is okay. Three point nine is mm, it's all right. I mean, four almost is right four out. is like <laughs> right out. <laughs> but I've learned. I, I just I'm becoming more comfortable with this precarious IPH. situation yeah 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 because we haven't had any wine spoil and uh it actually it just tastes so damn good mm-hmm. it is good it is good folks the we, high we took a is a case of the montepulciano to the scablands and people just loved it but the high ph also just it changes the way it feels sure you know, it's like smoother mm-hmm. um but i i probably will acidify it a little bit with the grape acid yeah 
tartaric acid, but we'll we'll do some bench trials to see because you it can feel flat if it doesn't have the right amount of acid. Yep. So the, there's a test that we do. It's a titration to measure what they call titratable acidity. Uh, it's not the total acidity. It's just what uh, what of it is titratable, which I'm not exactly, I don't remember <laughs> what the difference is. Um, but anyway, there's a number, right, that, that is, is like this is the happy number, and yeah. that number is seven. And so if it's at five or something like that, and we, we can add some, and we add a little bit of tartaric acid and we bring it up to maybe 6.5 or maybe we bring it up to seven and it's like, Ooh, it's got a little bite and we back it off and go down to maybe six. And it's like, okay, there. Yeah. So you, you, you do it by taste, but you're also measuring it using in the lab to see where you are. Yeah. And you kind of give you an indicator of like, because what you taste now is not going to be exact in the future as it ages. It's going to it's going to really integrate, is what yeah. they call it. It's yeah. like this integration over the over the time of the aging. So the earlier you can make additions, the better. We added a lot of acid when we when we uh Yeah, because we ferment. still have high pH it right, came out, in right high. out of the dirt. We dropped down to three point five, it's back up to four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like what are you doing? Wine? Dro- the wine dropped acid. <laughs> it totally did. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that was this was the first time like I was just looking at the equipment and there was like this after we ran the grape juice through it or whatever, there was just a layer of crystal acid, acid, on acid in there. Yeah. On the tank, you know, we're like, man, yeah, it's, it was really dropping it fast. And yeah. I've, I've, you know, I've heard a lot of this, this happens, um, but I had never quite witnessed it the, like, like this year. Yeah. However, it's amazing. It's going to be the best wine we've ever made. I believe it's already like, in my opinion, the cab is already better than the aged cab that we've made yeah. in the past. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So it is good. Really excited about it. It's only, it's a little less than, it's about 260 gallons worth of cab. So it's a little more than 100 cases. Yeah. So if we blend um, some of that yeah, cab. Yeah. So we've been talking about it. Like, do we blend it? It's so good. Well, yeah. But, you know, you want to maybe put a little bit of Merlot in there yeah. into the cab. So we make more. Right. Yeah. We've got a little bit of Merlot. Yeah. You put it in there as long as it's under twenty five percent, you can still call it Cabernet Sauvignon. Yep. It doesn't have to be considered a blend. Um, I think that's that's right. The right percentage. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll look up the rules. Uh, anyway, the Merlot will add. You know, be a good. It's a good blender with the cab. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The Merlot seemed to be pretty good too. Montepulciano, we got over 500, we got 530 gallons. Um, so that's going to be 200 cases. Um, and it's great too. It is. A, so it's good. So yeah, the malolactic fermentation is, uh, like I said before, it's a, it's a bacterial fermentation converting malic acid into lactic acid. And lactic acid is a weaker acid. It's also described as like having more of a buttery feel. Yeah, it's smoother, sort of taste. richer. Yeah. So it smooths it out. Kind of takes the <clears throat> sharpness down a little bit. Yeah, and that fermentation can take a while, but we we knocked it out. Yeah. And that was great because going out of town, I'm like, oh, I want to be able to put that SO2 in there. And you did, right, before you left? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Russ will be monitoring that while we're gone as it consumes the free SO2. That's right. And keeping the free parts per million up. And we got barrels coming in tomorrow. We're going to barrel down the cab. Yeah. So that's the ag update right now. All right. Rock and roll? Uh, Just working on uh, creation, writing materials. New stuff. Band members are, you know, raising kids now. Uh, We are going to be playing a little private... Uh, it's like a festival. Oh yeah, yeah, in November. What right before we go to Egypt? Yeah, on the fifth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like a few days before we leave. Uh, we'll be playing in the afternoon. So I really wanted to do a show, man. So I was like, well, book it, and they will come to practice. <laughs> 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 
They have babes. <laughs> I know, but it's going to be low key. It's just, it's kind of going to be more of like an acoustic show. Yeah. So we'll do that. Um, I'm working on writing materials. I've been working on some lyrics. Got a new song. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's tour season, so not a whole lot going on with yeah. the rock and roll right now. Right. So. Excellent. Uh, oh, yeah, I never loaded that. No, you didn't load it in. Too so, bad. Uh, no, it's there. It's Ancient there. rock bands, bro. So I got that a story. That was a rock and roll update. <laughs> well, I have Space Weather News. Hold on, bro. Where are you going? I know you got Space Weather News. I'm just <laughs> telling them that I have a, a, a lengthy story here. <laughs> oh, yeah. That I'm going to do on the Patreon oh, yes. after this. Yeah. It's, uh, but, you know, if you're not in the Patreon, you can check out this story. It's a great story. It's on uh, ancient-origins.net. Net? Net? Where's my browser? And it's called Three Scientific Mysteries of Plato's Atlantis. It's Uh, a really good story. Excellent. It's a long one, too. So we're going to go over that in the Patreon after this. But before that, of course, Space Weather News from spaceweather.com, where we get all our Space Weather News. Chance of flares today. Large sunspot AR3112 is poised to explode. NOAA forecasters estimate a 65% chance of M flares and a 30% chance of X flares today. Any eruptions will be geo-effective as the sunspot is almost directly facing Earth. Also, magnetic filament erupts. Updated. Yesterday, October 4th, a 200,000-kilometer-long filament of magnetism in the sun's southern hemisphere erupted. Snapping like a rubber band, it hurled part of itself into space. Debris from this blast might be heading for Earth. Soho coronagraphs saw hints of a CME emerging from the blast site, but the data stream stopped before this full CME was visible. The missing data should arrive later today. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 459.7 kilometers per second, and the density is 5.44 protons per cubic centimeter. Current sunspot number is 153. Uh, The neutron count is 2.5% above the space age average. And the KP index is 3, which is the top end of quiet. But the 24-hour max was 4, which is the lower end of the unsettled category. And that is your Space Weather News for the week. Hold on. The watcher says, what, 75% cab for the United States, but in Australia and Europe, it's 85%. Yeah, so that's right. You can put up to 25% yeah. of another grape in there without listing it on the label. Think of that. Yeah. Okay. So another update. Uh, since I will be, did we really go over this? I will be out of town next week, but we're going to try to do a show where I am the guest. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be remote. calling in Kyle's remotely. Kyle's going to be remote, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be interesting. And you're going to be recording it all on your end, so I'll just do it from the tower. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> what, I got to come down to the cube? Sounds so good in here. Okay, you're right. <laughs> it does. <laughs> we can't both be sounding like this the whole time. Why not? Road sewed. <laughs> <laughs> so what, are you going to do emails? or? Yeah, I got stuff? some emails, and th- these emails are old because we haven't been doing emails for a while. We're, we're going to need to do a you know a listener communications episode here pretty soon. Normally, that's actually the first thing we do after a trip because you know we come back from a trip and I'm not prepared to do a full episode on yeah. some topic, but this time I was able to, because I had most of the Path of the Pole stuff ready for this episode, I just needed to mark some more things. I was able to kind of catch up before we did this episode, but... We still need to do a listener communications because this first email is. I from... miss doing the email, like just having a, a handful of emails every show. Well, I can, I can, I can always do them on the on this segment. Yeah, but not if you have like four really long stories. Yeah, I know. So we should move. Don't it. blame me, bro. It's your fault. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is from July twenty sixth. It's called "I sent this to the wrong address." Dope. <laughs> from Nicholas. 
Currently running through the backlog. I started with Cosmographia, but I'm now listening to your backlog and currently listening to episode 95, The Giants of America book. You guys are great. Loving this podcast. Sweet. Material science is super interesting to me, so I am annoyed when I hear people stumbling on these things. So I read this and I was like, okay, you guys are awesome, but I'm also really annoyed. So I'm writing this email. <laughs> Glass is cooled slowly so it doesn't break. Freshly manufactured glass will shatter if it cools too quickly. Annealing or softening it causes it to handle stress better by being slightly more flexible. Tempered glass is the same process but longer periods of specific temperatures. Copper is heated and put into water to anneal. When you cold forge copper, it gets hard. When you heat and cool copper repeatedly, it gets harder. To work it cold, you must heat and quench it in water, and gold and silver have similar properties. Steel is heated till non-magnetic and cooled slowly to anneal. Just the opposite of heating till non-magnetic and quenching an oil. Tempering steel requires specific temperatures. Blacksmiths heat the back of a quenched blade to soften the back of the blade when constructing out of harder steel. Also, he says, pyramids, snakes, and scriptarts. Malta, Turkish cart ruts are due to chemical interactions. They weren't using the shamir. They were using a chemical process. Whatever was happening, the excess from the rock removal process would slop everywhere and get on the cart, then dribble down to the wheels and slowly eat away at the rock or soften it enough to make ruts. Maybe. Just a guess. Okay. I was I'm waiting for that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. He's just like, he's just announcing that this is how it happened. <laughs> I'm really annoyed with people who don't understand physical processes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the way, here's my theory about slopping rocks around. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the email, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's. I that's like good the metal info. the metallurgy stuff. Yeah, yeah that's good info. Cool. I mean, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure. Like he says, he's listening to the Giants of Ancient America, and then he's like, "You guys are getting all this metallurgy stuff wrong." I'm like, "Well, I don't it's even remember what we fault. said in episode 95." Yeah, you know. Well, I'm, but just I'm gonna totally positive the that he's right that we got it wrong. Well, it's the watcher's fault. He's the one that's supposed to. Google everything. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Feynman lectures from uh, Cam Cameron. Hello, Serpent Brothers. The Feynman lectures have got me thinking. It seems presupposed that time and space, or space and time, are f more fundamental than the objects which exist within them. Space is viewed as some sort of ocean in which things float, or some kind of canvas on which creation is painted. But what if it's the other way around, and objects of matter or energy, and the processes they necessarily go through as being such, are more fundamental? Space and time could be the epiphenomena of these objects. I can't see a way of describing space itself without referring to objects that seem to be within it. Good point. I like it. Even if you were to arbitrarily pick a point A, and point B to describe a couple of points in space. The axes of your three-dimensional grid would do you no good without an object or two on which to base your zero point on the axes. Maybe space could be seen as a degree of separateness between objects or their constituent parts just as easily as a soup these things are floating in. Therefore, space would arise out of object separateness. All objects in the universe also undergo changes or processes, what we call time may as easily arise from these processes rather than the processes occur within time. So I like this. After thing. all, how do you thing. describe time without referring to one object's relation with another, i.e. Yes. spins or orbits? The processes we see being carried out, we call time. Just a couple thoughts coming from a guy who thinks the universe might be an iceberg floating in a sea of imagination. Snake on. Cheers. This is great. Yeah. I love this reversal of, yes, the, yes. of the conceptualization. I, this is excellent. Yeah. Nice. That's right. I like, yeah, reversing it is great. It's the whole, like, I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me thing. <laughs> 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 We're not floating around in space. Space is out there because we're here, <laughs> right? right yeah. Okay. More from the character of physical law series from Anna Nimus. <laughs> uh, so it says uh, on the character of physical law. Greetings, Kyle and Russ. I'm glad you guys went over this book and lectures. 
This is one of two books that I often recommend to friends who want to know more about physics but don't necessarily have the math background. The other book I recommend is The Evolution of Physics by Einstein and Infeld. It was first published in 1938 and gives a real good historical perspective on how physicists began to abandon the mechanical view of the world and arrive at the modern theories like relativity and quantum mechanics. Highly recommend it if you have not read it. Cool. In episode 250, you had a question about what experiments were done to test how time moves at different paces, different uh, depending on how fast one is moving relative to another. Okay, so I saw multiple... E I just, I, I'm going to read this, but I saw multiple emails about this, and I... Every single one of them is explaining this in this same way, which isn't answering the question we actually asked, but it's still, it's great. So he says, the earliest experiment that confirmed time dilation was done by Ives and Stilwell. The approach is somewhat indirect as they measure the effect of time dilation on the Doppler shift of light emitted by atoms moving at relativistic speed. The more direct approach was not possible until the invention of portable atomic clocks and vehicles that can move fast enough for the effect to be measurable by said clocks. The first of these more direct experiments was done by HP Time and Frequency Laboratory with their famous flying clocks experiment in 1964, and he gives a link for that here. The setup is simple. Synchronize two atomic clocks on the ground, put one on a plane and fly it around the world, then measure the difference once they're back together and compare it to what the theory predicted. This experiment was later replicated by Haffel and Keating in 1971. And that might be Brian Keating, wonder, yeah. who we interviewed on the show. 71. They're often the ones who are cited for this experiment since they published their results in the journal Science. There are many more modern tests, but this is already quite a long message. So these are time dilation effects, but this is not the question we asked. The question we asked was more specific, which was how have they measured that in an object moving at relativistic speeds, light will, from the perspective of that object, appear to still be moving at light speed. The same light that can be measured from an object that isn't moving at relativistic speed also sees the light moving at light speed. That has not been done. Yeah. That's the question we had, but I've gotten a bunch of emails saying, well, they've done the time dilation stuff. Yes, that isn't the question. This is the question we asked was more specific. Yeah, because I'll, I think... Yeah, I, I, How I do you do it? I don't really know enough about You have this, to have an instrument in a thing that's moving relativistically. Right. Yeah, that's an extrapolation. But, yeah. Um, I saw something recently about the, the measuring of the speed of light, and there's really only one way to do it, and it's the two-way speed of light. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Like, there's this paradox because... Uh, <laughs> I knew I was going to get in trouble if I tried to explain this. <laughs> oh, well, then you should definitely do it. Okay. <laughs> Here it goes. <laughs> so you can only do it by basically like, okay, if so you take two clocks, you're just, we're going to measure the speed of light. So you, so if you have two clocks and you have two sensors and you separate them by a certain distance. Wait, we got to quit the podcast. You're out of vape juice? Both of my vape pins are out of battery. Uh. <laughs> Podcast over right now. Hold on, let me get through this, or I'll really <laughs> screw it up if I. <laughs> Sorry. So you so you synchronize the clocks, then you separate them. Yeah. Are they still at the same time, or do you have to consider when you moved them apart that they may have actually become unsynchronized? Yeah. But anyway, you do that, then you then you shoot a beam of light to the other one, but you don't ever know really if the clocks were still synchronized once you separated them, because uh. the only way to check. Is to send to something light, yeah. by light to. St I'm talking to you. Your way over there, and then we're yeah. using radio waves, and they're going moving at the light speed. Does the speed of light move the same in one direction as it does the other? Ah. There's no way to test this symmetry of light movement. Yeah, yeah okay. there's no way to test yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. The, then it's like, well, it's so they've devised all these different ways that you could. Well, how can we do this? And then you always end up with the problem of like, well, now that you've separated these two things. You can't check the synchronicity. You can't check to yeah. know if they're actually synchronized. And it's, <laughs> yeah, so there's all kinds of problems with that. All right. That's great. But you can, you can position a mirror way over there. Then you can shoot the light out, and then it comes back, and you mm -hmm. can measure, and you know the distance twice. But you don't know if it actually went faster going that way than it did when it came back. Sure, right. It could have gone faster going out and slowed down on the way back. Yep. Can't tell. Yeah. There's no way to find the average speed of light across the distance. I dropped the F-bomb on that one. There's no way. <laughs> Yet.
That's fine. All right. It's fucking fine. Don't worry about you it. You want to go get? Uh, you want to get? You your, got an extra your vape pod? Uh, I don't need a pod. I need a pen. Oh, no. Here, here's the charger. Okay, that's not going to help me right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we have more emails though. Um, let's see. This is from uh, Randy, short one called "Damned Show," guy and other guy. I am quite new to this pod, but have been making my way through the Fortean episodes. While listening, I can't help but thinking that there is a sci-fi series potential here. The series would follow the misadventures of a hapless of a hapless alien materials management crew as they accidentally <laughs> rain various items upon our Earth through the dereliction of their duties. Yes, That's great <laughs> snakes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's why it's called Damned Show. <laughs> He's listening to the Book of the Damned. That's great. <laughs> guy and other guy. Yeah, we need the whoever. I, Wait, who's which one of us is other guy? That's me. That's <laughs> no, that, he doesn't know. It's for sure me. <laughs> this, you're the chiminator, right? <laughs> That's you. The other guy just chimes in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh. Let's see. Okay, so this is from, let me make sure, Andrew. And it's called Snakes. He says, hey, fellas, I am so stoked to actually sit down and write this email out to you. I've only been listening to your podcast for a relatively short time, but I came by way of all the usual suspects, probably originally starting with Graham Hancock, who knows how long ago. I believe it was something you did together with Uncharted X that first turned me onto your podcast, and I quickly began to dive into older episodes, and two really got me inspired to reach out. First off, I am a longtime audio engineer and musician, so I immediately liked your content. I'm sure you get all kinds of communications with people who talk to you like you know them since they listen to you. So at the risk of that, I immediately felt like we'd be great buds and have some amazing conversations if we ever had the opportunity because of so many shared interests. When I listened to your part two part episodes on acoustics and resonance in Egypt with Sebastian, I felt like I was one of the few people who could follow both the history and the audio side of things. I actually started working on a song that Sebastian joked listeners would make out of the recordings y'all made in Egypt. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Second, I was either le- listening to the Vermont Stone Structures or maybe the Montana episode, but one of you mentioned that there was a list of sites of interest in America that y'all had compiled. I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and wondered if there is anything in my neck of the woods within a few hundred miles that I could check out. Any sites you may have to check out don't have to be audio-related, but I thought I would also offer up that I have a bunch of audio gear and even an RTA, or real-time audio analyzer, with a pink noise generator. I would love to play around with that thing in Egypt. If you ever need any help editing things, or really whatever audio music-related, I'd be more than ecstatic to help out. Hope to hear back soon from Andrew. Awesome, dude. Yeah. So, yeah, let me give an update on this. Um, The, you know, people sending me say, like, are are there cool places? I still have my old list. It's, It's a... Of, of stuff it's in multiple different things like i have a list of things and i also have massive amounts of of uh, google earth marks that i've and uh, and then other people's collections that i've pulled in kmz files but those were th- those are from i mean that was it was useful a long time ago but more and more you can actually do this much easier by going online like if you use atlas obscura you can almost always find great stuff in your area and it's GPS centered, so you can just say, wherever I am right now, tell me all the weird and cool stuff around me. Mm. And you can just, I mean, Atlas Obscura is a fantastic resource. Now, it doesn't necessarily always have the strange, obscure archaeological sites, which I do have a lot of those on my, in my, uh, you know, in my list and in my uh, Google Earth marks or whatever. But on the other hand, a lot of those archaeological sites aren't necessarily places you can get into. Some of them are on private land. Other ones are just closed to the public because it's an archaeological dig or whatever. Uh, so it's kind of a crapshoot on whether or not you can get into these places. So I would just say to the people who want to know about cool places to go through, start with Atlas Obscura and go from there. You know, And then maybe even start with the private land. Or you could do it that way. <laughs> start with the private land. Go at night. Dress in black. 
Forest Ninjas. There's only one way to get here. We have to drop in from above. <laughs> you didn't do the fucking high part. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to do the... Yeah, my bad. <laughs> you, I thought you had it handled. I mean, all you need is the bass line. I gave you, I gave you your part. <laughs> All right, one more email, and then we'll uh, we'll close out the show. This is from Tony. He's, it's called Thanks, Snake Bros. I just wanted to reach out and say thanks. I don't even remember how I came upon your podcast several months ago, but it came at a low point in my life and has helped pull me out of a months-long funk. After years of busting my ass at work, I was burned out. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to leave work at work, so I brought it home. My annoyance and short-temperedness was a wedge that opened more and more distance between myself and my wife and kids. As the months of feeling like this wore on, even though I knew there was a problem, I lost even the desire to make a meaningful change in my life. So that is the backdrop for what started out as a search for a mindless time filler during my commute. In the time... Since first clicking on Snake Bros Episode 2, it has become much more than that. You've captured my attention and reignited my curiosity. The two hours a day I spend in a car driving to and from work are no longer wasted. In fact, I'll often sit in the car, still listening to the podcast for a number of minutes after I get to work or home just to hear where you're taking the conversation. You've provided me with laughs, awe for those that have come before us, and legitimate head-scratching mysteries. All good things to distract and or take your mind off of a shitty job or set of personal circumstances. And somewhere along the way, I've also regained my sense of self and been able to repair my relationship with my family. Wow. I'm only about one-third of the way through episode 86, and I am eagerly looking forward to learning more snake facts, challenging the standard model, and cursing the skirt darts. <laughs> Hi, one from Tony. Wow. Thank you, That's Tony. Awesome, That's so awesome. So Get if you were here, man. You if, just... if you were at episode... 86 when you wrote that in August. Well, maybe in a year or so you'll hear us read your email and respond to you, buddy. <laughs> he's, he's knocking out a so today. It's true. He's maybe it'll two be a two-hour commute. Yeah, that's right. 86. So he only has, you know, 180 episodes to go. Yeah. He's still got half a year to get to where we are now. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for all the emails. Sorry that I'm so late on reading some of these, but we'll catch up, you know, and is what it is. Oh, so maybe we do a communication sewed while I'm out of town. That's what we could that'd do. Be, that'd yeah, be yeah, easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then um, you could read some of them. Bench. I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about like making Kyle read the, some of the emails. I'll like, read the he's emails. He's like, I dude. can't read, bro. I don't want to put you to shame. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, Kyle, read this email, and then you hear, you can capture my attention Dude, and read no, it. No, no, I'll read the emails, and it's going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're and just... no one will ever want you to read emails that ever again. That would be again. fantastic, bro. Kick my ass. Go for You'll it. Be you're just going to turn on your Google, your, your reader <laughs> and hold the phone up to the mic. <laughs> when people hear their own words in my melodious voice <laughs> their minds will be blown maybe they will you be should, maybe they will shed tears of joy maybe you should actually like just sit with the guitar and play a song and sing the email <laughs> <laughs> started listening everyone to will feel connected now i'm listening to snake bros <laughs> found you by all the usual suspects <laughs> Cam Hancock, Randall Carlson, Joe Rogan, and Snake Bros. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> It'll be a hit. All right. I want to thank everybody for supporting the show on the uh, Pyramid Scheme. Yes. We do have a couple of uh, executive producers. First in the queue is Andrew Ryan. 200 bucks. Thank you so much. No note. Andrew Ryan. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, he's from... He's from California. Thank you so much, bro. Really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, send a note. We'll read it in like a year. <laughs> uh, no, but but if you do make a PayPal donation, even if it's not a uh, an executive or an associate executive producer donation, which is you know associate executive fifty dollars to a hundred and executive is a hundred dollars or more, if you write a note, I'll read it. <laughs> 
I don't yeah. care if it's two bucks. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, uh, PayPal has a, I think it's like a 250 character limit, so it's like a tweet. Yeah. So I'll read them all. Or if you want to send a longer note, just put in the in the donation. Like I've sent a longer note to the email. Send it to brothers of the serpent uh, at gmail dot com, and then I'll make Kyle read it as the donation you note. Just you, you <laughs> just turn you just turn the donation notes into books. Good job. <laughs> People want to write books, bro. <laughs> I, get I so shall many, read your book. I get so many emails now where they're like, this is a book. <laughs> Suck it up. I, I shall <laughs> read your tomes. Okay, this is uh, another executive producer donation from Randall Bruck. And he did write a note. He says, thank you. I did find Randall through Joe, but that did not lead to you. Hmm. I also found Skeptico through Joe Rogan, and that led to Soraya. Ah. And that led to you. Aha. All right. We got a weird right, Rogo I guess donation. I'll, I guess here. I'll have to tell Soraya that he has sent us at least one listener. <laughs> <sighs> he says, Brothers of the Serpent is like hanging out with my smartest friends. My dog can only talk pyramids for so long. <laughs> <laughs> snacks! Snacks! <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> also from California. Cool. Yeah, thank y'all so much. So I yeah, I'll send you those. Yep. But those are two executive producers of this show, the 261st Brothers of the Serpent episode. Yes. And if you get value out of the show, you can always join the Patreon and get extra t- content. We don't all, we're not posting Patreon content all the time because we're, you know, it's value for value model. If you get value out of the main show that we publish, you can just donate. But we do put Patreon content up. Like some the bumper songs are going up there slowly. But surely, eventually they'll all be on there. And occasionally, like today, we do an additional Patreon segment, which is just, you know, you know, we just keep going and talk about whatever we want to talk about. Like on this one, Kyle's going to read this long, interesting Atlantis story. So you can sign up to the Patreon. That's one way to support the show. You can also, like these people did, send donations directly through PayPal. We also take crypto, but you can go to the donations or the support segment of the website to find out all the different ways. And like Kyle was saying, you know, you can send us a check if you don't like any of those platforms. Yeah. Mail us a check to the P.O. Box. You can find the P.O. Box address in the Discord chat. That's right. You can get into the Discord chat from the website as well. So to email us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. I read all the emails. I can't read them all on the show, but I read a lot of them on the show. And thank you guys for all the emails. Website, brothersoftheserpent.com. Has all the podcast-related stuff there, a bunch of different goodies and interesting things, including ways to join the Pyramid Scheme, which is our support, uh, the value for value support. You can also find the links to the Discord. That is run by Jeff. Thanks very much to him. And a bunch, we have a whole bunch of admins. They're all awesome. Also, the Library of the Serpent that Jeff has put together is there on the website, as well as the Snake Skins, our merchandise store. You want hats, you want hoodies, you want t-shirts, you want stickers, you want magnets. It's all there through Tee Public, and then the hats are made by a local place here that Laura found for us. And uh, yeah, other than that, thank you guys so much for supporting the show and listening. We love you. You can get ayahuasca mugs there, too. Hey. What? Ah, you know. <laughs> some of them don't want to drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. I'm a good golden nectar of the gods.